Hello, everybody. Welcome to another DevOps.com webinar. I'm Jared Richter from DevOps.com. Today's exciting webinar is design and operation of a resilient real-time SaaS application. Today's webinar is brought to you by our friends at BMC. And please note that today's presentation will be recorded and the slides and presentation will be available on DevOps.com within 24 hours. Today we have joining us Michael Moran, SaaS architect at BMC, and uh, Jesse Hodges, lead engineer at BMC. Let's get the show on the road and uh, let's see the presentation. Excited. For sure. Seth, can you advance the slide? Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Moran. I'm the senior SaaS architect at BMC. So we're going to go through a presentation today and show you our product and kind of the road map of how we got there. Uh, Jesse, do you want to introduce yourself quick? Sure, yeah, my name is Jesse Hodges and I am the lead uh, back-end developer on, on the TrueSight Pulse platform um, and I'm responsible for maintaining a lot of the services that we've used to scale out the platform. Alright, next slide. So our agenda today is to go through a quick introduction to our SaaS app, TrueSight Pulse. Then we'll go through how we got there, so where did we start, what was the MVP, what were some of the troubles we ran into along the way, and what did we learn from that experience, and then really, how do you run something like that without downtime or burning out your engineers? So, next slide. What is TrueSight Pulse? Real-time infrastructure and application monitoring as a service. And that's quite a mouthful, but what does it really mean? Pulse was created of a necessity to see what was actually happening with infrastructure and applications every second. On-demand computing necessitates squeezing every last dollar and ounce of performance out of an instance. You need to see what is happening all of the time. Not every minute, not every 15 seconds, but every single second. And that's what we mean by real time. We created Pulse because nothing out there allowed that level of granularity for real-time applications, big data applications, and microservice architectures. Having this level of visibility is a game changer for us, but that visibility comes at a price, especially for us, giving customers consistent real-time delivery regardless of scale with no outages and no downtime means that every mistake is seen in real time. So if there's any data that's missing or something stops working in real time, you can always see that. So for the next slide, you can see an example of a TrueSight Pulse dashboard. In this dashboard, we have a mix of things. We have a list of some sample servers from a staging server or a staging environment. We have application requests and response time so we can see what's affecting the user. We can see how much traffic is going through, so our uh, network traffic. So those are our metrics that are coming off of the servers themselves. And then we have application metrics, which are coming off the applications that have been instrumented and all of that together gives us that single pane of glass. Those are our KPIs for service delivery, and that's how our customers use the product as well. We're our own use case, and we understand our customer demands for reliable service because we use Pulse to monitor Pulse. So we go to the next slide. What we're going to talk about is the highway to building a real-time SaaS service. So what did it take? What did we learn? And in the end, what is real-time? Next slide. So here's what we thought the journey would be like. Everything would be rosy. We'd build out that MVP. We slowly scale it up. We add more users, add a little data, a little at a time, and we just slowly organically grow. Next slide. What it actually looked like was a mad surge of data. You get an unrelenting onslaught of data that never quits. It's not seasonal. There's no off time. The data comes in real time forever, all of the time. People don't add a server at a time, they add a VPC or an entire environment. And that was a very, very interesting use case that we hadn't run into before, which is data will always come because the server never goes off. Yes, environments scale up and down, but the server will be sending data in real time all of the time. So next slide. So the beginning, what did it look like? It was the MVP. We split out our website, so you'd have the website and the API, two different processes. So we could balance between the domains. There's a load balancer, so you can add in uh, scalability on those services. So there's multiple instances, and then there's a database for data. It's replicated for failover, and we're feeling pretty good. And it seems like a good start. 
there's a load increases, things get harder to manage, our site, APIs timeout, database seems to take forever to make simple queries, and we need to fix that. We start losing data, and everyone can see it, it's early, people understand, but it needs to be fixed. So Jesse, what did we do? So at, at this point, um, you know, it, it became it became really apparent that we needed to, to sort of understand what the bottlenecks were. And and at this at this level it was it was fairly obvious that we were that we were just pounding the database um, with too many writes, too many reads, and you know, with all of our business model application along with the real time data, it just couldn't keep up. But we verified that by instrumenting you know, various points, our request response times, looking at query times, and, and, and really found that what we suspected was true was that the, the database was just taking too long to respond, um, and we couldn't rely on it. So that's, that's where we sort of ended with this. So we found that the hot path then was ingress and egress. So if we go to the next slide, a lot of the times for real time, this is what you'll find. So we started to split things out a little bit. So we broke the website, broke the APIs, and then split out the ingress and egress paths to be in their own services, which is our start of microservices. So as we started to break things out into their own responsibilities, it became easier to scale up those services to see where the performance impact was. The second part of that is we actually found there's a very, very different profile for real-time data than non-real-time data. So with real-time data, you can just push as much as you can. You can shard that out. You can have things that are replicated. But for your non-real-time data, maybe something like a relational database still continues to make sense. So because you have different access patterns, because you have different partitioning, uh, you can then split things out and really use the things that matter the most to you. So in this case, we ended up with uh, the mix of the database and then a little bit of shared caching. So as we start to scale out some of those services, we try to figure out which things can replicate across and make uh, the scalability just that much simpler. Uh, so in this part, having the multiple databases and the microservices were kind of our beginning of that path, and then splitting out the ingress and egress. Jesse, do you want to tell us a bit more about microservices? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I want to make a point about about this. I think this represents a fairly common pattern. You start out with sort of a, a monolithic service, and as, as you start to grow, certain parts of the app need to scale differently than than the other app. And for us, it was it was the real time data. But I think um, you know any any application that's starting to grow and experience growing pains could take the same model. Like you identify the parts that that are painful, and you break those out into independent services. Um, and that gives you get, that gives you the ability to to really scale that layer of the service as needed for that particular service. Um, and for us, um, since ingress and egress was was such a big part of our, our our scale, we even split those into two separate microservices. And depending on your needs, that that may or may not be necessary. You should do what's right for your environment and get as granular as you need to be. Um, but it also gives us the ability to have different SLAs for different um, parts of the parts of the environment. We can have different software teams working on different services. Um, we can update one service, but not have to not have to affect the other service. And 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 like I said, we can size those as needed. Um, so this this actually beyond just scaling brings a whole host of other benefits to the table um, that can be leverage with a microservice architecture. Um, but for us, it was really scaling was, was the main driver. All right, so things are going well. We hit the front page of Hacker News, and that dreaded load spike comes, and bam, services go offline. We start losing data again, and because we're real time, everyone can see us losing data in real time. So we need to decouple the ingress with actually saving the data to make sure that we can protect ourselves both from a service going down and from the database backing up. So we go to the next slide. Queues and service discovery to the rescue. So by putting a queue in the middle of our ingress path, we can now protect both our database and our database writer. So this way as data is coming in, we can store it, we can keep that history, and if something has a little glitch along the way, or even you have a deployment and something didn't quite go right, you now have that data stored in a separate path 
and you can pull it off as quick as you can process it. And the queue really made our ability to scale much more apparent because uh, that way we could scale the queue, we could scale the ingress, and we could scale our DB rider, and we could protect the database from that onslaught of data. So when someone spins up a new environment, we can auto scale out the queues and auto scale out our riders, and that way we don't have issues that will affect other customers. But that did lead to a very interesting problem, which is how do I know the health of all of these services and how do I find them? Initially, we had HA proxies that were running on the boxes, and then they would just talk to all the other ones, so we had load balancing on a per-server basis, which worked not too bad, but console actually provided an excellent way for us to both do health checks and a way for us to figure out which services were live, not live, could take data, were not ready to take data, and we didn't have to then update our load balancers every single time a new service came online or went offline. It was all dynamic. So instead of having to run Chef or Puppet or Salt or Ansible, anytime a new node comes out on any of the services, now everything just talks to each other. They only talk to healthy nodes, and so it allows your auto scale and auto discovery to make things much, much simpler. The key of that was to making a good health check. Do you want to tell us about health checks, Jesse? Um, sure, but maybe, uh, actually, I want to back up a little bit here um, and talk about just the queue a little bit here. Um, so uh, you'll, you'll notice, like Mike mentioned, uh, a queue. Um, but if you look at the diagram there, we actually are using Kafka. And, and I think Kafka, if you're not familiar with it, has a number of advantages over um, something like Rabbit and Q or an, a, other types of typical queuing systems in that you know it has a persistent storage layer. It's it's a very scalable, um, and, you know, can scale up to you know, thousands of servers as needed, and the consumption off that queue is really controlled by the reader. Um, and so different, we 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 it gave, it gave us the ability to have different services read that data at different times independently of each other. Um, which has added a ton of flexibility into how we scale. So, I mean, I just want to mention that quickly. Um, and then uh, for for health checks, um, you know, we have uh, we have another slide coming up on health checks as well. I'll try to talk to it about it more in detail. Um, but uh, the uh, the health checks are each each application has a HTTP URL um, that it registers with COF, with console. And console is able to um, check that periodically to make sure that the application is healthy. And if it goes away, it can take it out of service discovery. So other consumers of the service discovery can immediately stop using it. Um, and by the same manner as new applications come on or if it's restarted and the unhealthy condition goes away, it's made immediately available to those consumers again so that clients can only talk to the healthy nodes. Um, I, I do want to speak some more about um, health checks in general, but there's another slide on that coming up, so I think I'll hold off. Cool. All right, so what did we learn? Think about sharding early on and use the right keys. A lot of the times you'll pick something like account ID, which is just too high level if you have to start breaking things down. Account ID only works when you have that size of box. When you go above that, you're now going to either need to create a bigger box or have to redo your sharding strategy. So look at that early on and make sure you choose the right key. Choose the data store and the right uh, data for your types. So how you access the data, how you read, how you write, how you replicate, not every data is going to have to fill the same uh, requirements, which means you probably don't have to use the same service for everything. Maybe you can use a NoSQL database for something, maybe relational makes sense, Trying to jam everything into the same one will lead to scale issues if you're using the data differently. So yeah, choose the I right data store for your type. Can I jump in here and make a point yeah. here? Like this isn't just about going from relational to NoSQL. Like um, there are a lot of data types that are appropriate for a relational model database, and you definitely should use them for that. Um, so don't don't fall into the trap of oh it's got to be NoSQL key value like that that is not always the right choice it just depends on what you're doing that's all I wanted to say completely agree uh, queues can unblock bottlenecks and prevent data loss 
the queue gives you the ability to keep that backlog at bay, to protect your services, to protect your database, and really to control flow. Uh, and that can give you a huge amount of control if you're running into high load scenarios, be it somebody adding in a whole bunch of new servers, or if you're seasonal. So if you have a good sharding strategy, queues can really help you in that case. Microservices make test and scaling easier and increase developer ownership. In that monolith, some people are responsible for different components, but when you break that out into a microservice, there's now an, an obvious owner. There's an obvious way to scale and test. Without having to redeploy the entire monolith, you can get some advantage with microservices. It doesn't make sense in all scenarios. If you have a very, very small application, you probably don't need to break it out. Uh, but as we scaled up, breaking things into their own responsibilities helped us both from the development side and from the operation side. And lastly, service discovery will simplify your life and your deployment. If you have to talk to multiple nodes, find a way that you can auto-discover what's going on in your environment so you don't have to update configurations either manually or through Chef. Make it so you're always talking to healthy services and you know exactly what, what is healthy and where it is. Uh, so if something goes up or something goes down, it's all automatic. Nobody has to get up to fix anything. And to do all of that, monitor everything that you have. You don't always know what's important, so monitor it and then pair back from there. So I think that goes into a nice segue of how do you actually run a service like this without downtime or burning out your engineers? Jesse? Yeah, so, um, so i got to sort of take the lead now for, for the next couple of slides and just talk a little bit about how, how we manage it, how we monitor, how we, how we deal with running these services. Um, so uh, can you go to the next slide, Seth? Um, so let's just keep in mind these goals. Um, you know, we want to have a service that's always up, no outages, no slowdowns, no disruption, or as little as possible. Uh, definitely, definitely no downtime. Uh, I mean, if your monitoring system is not up and reliable, it's not very useful. If it's le if it's less reliable than your application, it's definitely not useful. So, um, in our in our point, this is very important. But for any application, you know, keeping your customers happy, no nobody likes slow responses or or insufficient insufficient responses. Um, you know, we need to maintain that the service delivery is consistent. Um, I sort of already mentioned this, but you know, we we want to have a nice experience for our users. Um, and very very important to me, um, you know, personally and everybody on my team. You know, we want our operators and our developers to not be completely crazy, not have to work 80 hours a week, be able to get some rest, be able to take time off able to enjoy their lives, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, I find that, I find that very, into, very important. So, so how do we do that? Um, so first, uh, next slide, Seth. We put everybody on call. Hey, like, what? You just said you want people sane and well rested. Well, um, this kind of goes back to some of the DevOps philosophy of sharing a culture of, of shared responsibility. Um, you know, I, in previous roles I've been in an ops where, you know, only the ops team had the pager, um, only the ops team was on call. It was it, it was very difficult sell to go to a developer and say, hey, uh, can you fix this exception? It woke me up at four in the morning. And, you know, they might be, I'd like to, but I can't fit it into my sprint plan, you know. But if you switch, if you flip the script, and they are the ones getting woken up at four in the morning, I bet, I bet, I bet that they will find a way to fit it into their sprint plan. Um, so putting everybody on call is is just a way of making everybody responsible. And by making everybody responsible, you give everybody the the initiative to make sure that things run smoothly. So when problems come up, and somebody and somebody uh, somebody gets woken up in the middle of the night. You know, they should know how to deal with the problem. They should know if they should be able to have the power to, you know, make the problem go away if they can, or if it's not something that's actionable. Um, and and if if not, you know, they should be able to to fix the problem. So um, we have a mix in our uh, environment of sort of typical monitoring tropes like 
alerting on CPU or memory or disk usage. Um, but we also have the aforementioned health checks for different applications. Um, and then sometimes, depending on the need, we may set an alarm in TrueSight Pulse to monitor a specific KPI for one of our applications. Um, KPI, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with the term, it's the key performance indicator. Um, so what, we could have a combination of all of these. And ideally, you know, when somebody gets woken up in the middle of the night or even in the afternoon, um, we have a run book for our different services. They can go and look at and say, uh, oh, I've never dealt with this, or, or, or maybe, I, maybe I have, but it's 2 in the morning and I, my brain's fried. Uh, they can go to this run book and have sort of a step-by-step -step and playbook of, of how to deal with the problem. And if not, they can they can write it, they can add it. We encourage everybody to contribute and try to make a better culture for everybody. Um, and then the the other point of that is, you know, our our devs should should be able to delete or adjust those alarms as necessary. Um, we have re weekly review meetings where we talk about the alarms that that were set off during the last week and trying to decide, you know, is this really necessary? Could we just turn it off? If it is, if it is necessary, how do we fix it so that we, it's not a problem? Did the person that get, got woken up have enough information to deal with it? And, and, try to, and try to make that like a shared collaboration of everybody um, on the same page. Um, next slide, please. So I want to go and talk a little bit more about health checks here. Um, and Michael, if you have anything, jump in. I forgot to ask you on the last slide. Um, but, but the idea here, especially in a microservice environment, is it becomes very difficult for, say, somebody that's just on the ops or the infrastructure team to really know much about what's going on with service Z over there. Um, they're probably not really familiar with the requirements or, or, what's, or whether it's important or how important it is. Um, but you know who is important? Who does, I mean, sorry, who does know about the requirements and who does know about the health are the developers that are actually working on that application. So, um, so we ask the application to, to expose its own health. Um, and that can be based on anything that the developers think are important. And we have a couple of um, standard checks that we use, but but we also allow our developers to to create any kind of check that they think is important, right? If there is something that they think that they should get, get woken up about, they, they should create a health check for it. Um, and we expose this health check information just over a simple HTTP port. Uh, like we said earlier, we register that in console. Um, but pretty much any monitoring system would be able to, to monitor these types of health checks, uh, Nagios, or you could write your own pretty quickly. Um, and if it returns a 200, we're good. And if it returns a 500, uh, we're not good. Um, and hopefully there's some information in the health check output that tells, tells us a little bit more about what the problem is. If it doesn't return at all, well, that also tells us something, and we should probably look into that. Um, the developers maintain these. The developers add new ones as they need to, and the developers remove them when they're no longer useful. Uh, but it's a uniform interface across all of our services. They all expose health check at the same URL, and um, it's, just, it's just a known place that you can go and check things out. And a lot uh, of this data that's in the health check is also graphed. So that data gets graphed so you can see it over time, so you can learn things about it. You can see the history from real time in one second or looking at it over the week or the month, uh, just so you know what normal is, uh, and then alerts on those things as well. Yeah, um, that's true. And there's a lot of different types of health checks you can have, too. They could, you could be checking um, whether or not some dependency that you require, like a database, is responsive. That's a common one. Um, but they could re they could relate on other things like performance. Like if your 90th percentile response time exceeds a certain value, you may want to alert on that. Um, so you can use this to enforce SLAs. Um, you could um, potentially have them alert on business uh, business related metrics. Like um, for example, if your if your conversion rate falls below a certain percentage, maybe you you want to alert somebody about that. Um, we, we use a lot of different um, metrics and health checks packages. 
uh, or we use a few different, mostly um, for our Java services, we use the Code Hail metrics um, package, and we report those to our um, back end through our, um, for, through our metrics reporter, which is available on our GitHub account. Um, and uh, let's go, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about metrics on the slide after this, but um, something that was alluded to earlier, um, uh, so, the, so there was a question there, but um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, something that was alluded to earlier um, that, that Michael mentioned, but I just want to make very explicit, is um, the the idea of maintaining services and how many, like how many nodes, like if you're if you're building out these microservices or macro services or whatever, like how do you size it to make sure that that you can maintain service in the face of failure? Um, so I like to use a method that um, that I, I call chicken counting, um, but I don't think anybody else does. And the idea is that you know chickens can uh, count one, and they can count more than one. So we want to always be in the more than one category. Um, so that means minimum for any service that we're running, uh, we always we're having at least two nodes of that service uh, running. Um, we may have more, and the the rule for sizing that is that if you lose one, the remainder can handle the existing load. Right, so um, if you need three nodes to handle the load at full volume, then you need to run four nodes. Um, so this gives us this gives a lot a lot of resiliency because when one service goes down or gets behind a network partition or gets into some bad state, the other nodes should be able to handle the load. You should be able to handle deal with intermittent failures um, without impacting the customer at all. I'd like to add that not impacting the customer also means not waking us up at night. Yeah. So if you can have that failure and things don't have to then alert your ops people or your developers or whoever's on call, nobody has to get woke up, things just work, and then you get up in the morning or it's just part of business as usual. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's an interesting question in the chat that um, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide or one or two slides and then I'll, I'll address it because it goes along with some of the some of the content that we have there. Um, so, uh, with with all this in mind, like um, you know, with, with the service discovery and the two nodes and 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 the ability for 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 the services to deal with that kind of failover, um, it gives us even uh, even another benefit is that we can now we can now roll out code. We can we can roll out new new versions of the code um, with no effect on the customer whatsoever. Um, you know, ideally, like you know, doesn't doesn't always work out like that. But you know, um, in the general flow of things, um, if if I need to update our ingest service, um, I can go apply the update to one node, verify that it works, apply the update to the other node, and during those times that one service is down, the other services are picking up the load. Um, and uh, and then again, you know, if if a service goes down for other reasons, we can still handle that. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be able to survive something catastrophic, uh, but if something is starting to go wrong, it at least gives us enough lead time to hopefully react before things get too bad. Mike, anything on this? No, I think that's great. Okay. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, I'll address the question here. Uh, Richard asked, uh, monitor then change sounds like agile applied to DevOps. So how do you set up experiments, change one thing and compare to existing, uh, or change two things and compare to each other? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so for every, every one of our services that we have, we, or, or the developer actually, you know, sort of keeping in, in mind the themes of, of ownership, um, we don't leave this up to the ops guy or some or the ops girl or somebody in a different group. The developer is responsible for creating a dashboard that represents what they see as the KPIs for that service. Um, so we monitor everything. We'll send a lot of metrics about a new service to a dashboard 
to to the back end, and then the developer will create um, will create a dashboard, picking the things that they think are important. Um, as they work with the service and as they as they roll this out into production, they'll they'll test their assumptions against about how they thought the service would behave against how it, it's actually behaving. And over time, they'll be able to refine that. They'll be able to take some metrics out that they that they realize aren't that important. They'll create new metrics or n or new new things to look at. They'll they'll add new things to look at that they realize that are important. And eventually, you know, after a little while, they should get to a dashboard that that really any they or any developer should be able to kind of look at and say, are things okay? And the process of this, the developer gets very familiar with what the normal is, and, and this really gets to Richard's question, so it may be kind of hard to see on this uh, slide, but this is, a, this is a representation in our staging environment of our, uh, of our ingest service. So this is the primary data, data path for, for flow, we call it Sasquatch, um, and we have a couple of metrics here, um, I won't mention them all, but in the upper left corner, uh, that's, that's our rate of events per second that we're that we're ingesting um, it's it's a it's a one minute rolling average um, but we're, we're reporting the value of that average every second so it's a little slow to respond but it gives us a nicer curve um, and we also have sort of the JVM heap usage and then on the right top and bottom we have network statistics and then on the bottom we have some some other rate variables that are related to how we do the validation. And the reason that's there is because we've had trouble with that piece of it in the past, and it's something we want to keep an eye on. Um, at some point, we could probably take it out. But looking at this pattern, you know, we can see what we can kind of see what the normal range of behaviors is. And then if we go over to the to the middle, uh, if we look at the middle uh, uh, screenshot there. Um, We'll see. This is this is where I did a rollout. So you can see right in the middle of of each graph, there's a little there's a little yellow dot tick there. That's a, that's an event that that indicates that one of the services restarted. The the dark blue line service restarted, and then the the yellow one over to the right indicates that the other service restarted. So you could see like immediately when that happened that things changed. Um, you can see that the the ingest rate dropped to zero and then started up again and sort of over the minute following is increasing up to, to get to kind of um, to uh, steady state. Um, and then you see the same kind of thing on the other one when it when it restarts. Um, we see um, you know similar kind of values on the other on the other ones as well and the network it's it's hard to see anything useful there. Um, in this case it's not really that that interesting. Um, and then we look at the at the last one, um, and we can see things really returning to normal. Now, one of the goals of this rollout might have been to to change the number of validation calls per second, right? So and this will be a way to sort of validate like that 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 the action that we took had the intended effect. Um, in this case, the purpose of this rollout was just exactly to demonstrate this, so there wasn't any actual code change. Um, but but you do see a few interesting things, and by sort of being familiarizing yourself with these dashboards, you can gain a lot of deep insight into into how your application works. Any comments, Mike? Yeah, I think if you look at two pieces of this, the first is that things in real time show up in real time. So when we did that initial rollout, you could see things drop, you could see them come back to their steady state, and you could see if the problem got worse or it got better. And I think that's a really powerful thing, and this kind of goes back to Richard's question, which is how can you make a change and then monitor against it? So either with feature flags or canary nodes, we can push something out, we can see what it looks like, and if we want to roll it back, we can roll it back, or alternatively, we can push it out if things look good, we can go to the next node. Having that value in real time, having that data in real time, gives us more assurance that what we're doing is right. If we had to wait two, three, four, five minutes to see some of these stats come back, we may end up having impact in production. So having that data there for us has made it a lot easier for us to feel confident about the changes that we make. Yep, 
So um, I think I guess I'll hand it back to Mike now to to wrap it up. Um, that's sort of the end of of my slides. Yeah, I think we're all done. So if there's some questions or answers that people have, we can work through those. All right. Well, thank you both, Michael and Jesse. That was great. I think we learned a lot. And now we're going to take some questions. So um, anybody, just a reminder, on the right side of your screen, towards the bottom of your GoToWebinar box, is the question panel. So please type any questions you may have there, and we'll do our best to get to them. So let's take some questions. So all right, first question, what makes for a good health check? Jess, you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so a, a good health check um, is actionable. Um, it has meaning, and um, it, well, yeah, the, the, it's actionable and it has meaning. Um, and it, so it shouldn't be like something, it, it shouldn't, like, you don't want to have a health check that, that alerts um, for a condition that will immediately recover or has no customer impact. Um, those, those types of things do often get in there, but um, when they do, you should ensure that um, you, you clean them up and deal with them as soon as they do. Um, actionable means um, that you know, the, the output of that health check, the, the value you know, that you get at 3 a.m. on the pager, tells you enough at least to point you in the right direction to be able to solve the problem should the should you need to take some action for it um, so we so we try to we try to augment that with run books and uh, with you know detailed messages about what what might be going wrong um, you know so in in your health check if you're returning an unhealthy response you should definitely include a, a clue to to the person to the poor person that might be reading that um, about how to resolve it. All right, uh, I got another question here. Actually, I believe this one. Uh, any recommendations for microservice frameworks? So, depending on the language, uh, we use Drop Wizard at BMC. So a lot of our microservices are built on the Drop Wizard framework using Code Hail metrics. On our GitHub, we've open sourced a couple different pieces so you can use the syncs to push out to TrueSight Pulse or to talk directly to the agent directly. Uh, so that way, if you have your own metrics you want to push, uh, you can do that all through very simple configuration. Uh, on the node side, uh, we use Express, uh, Restify, so there's a couple different pieces in there. I'd, I'd say there's whatever the framework that you're going to use will probably give you some amount of tools. It's really how do you get the metrics out, health checks, how do you provide something like that. For us, it's all HTTP. And then how do you do some things like service discovery to hook into those? So as long as you have client libraries that can hook into all the pieces that you're trying to do, uh, that's been really helpful for us. Jesse, yeah. you got any recommendations? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Drop Lizard, um, and, and I, I mostly work on the Java code. Uh, so I, 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 I really have enjoyed that. We use it for um, we use it for Kotlin. We use it for uh, Java services, um, and we we have a couple of pieces that we've that we've contributed to the community for um, interacting with the console and doing the service and health check registration. Um, that's that's available um, on our GitHub account. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of other competitors I'm not familiar too familiar with. Uh, Spring Boot is one a lot of people use. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you're a fan of the Spring ecosystem, then you should probably go ahead and use use that. Um, I do definitely recommend using some kind of framework that has the operational aspect of running a service in mind, and, and that's where, that's where I think uh, where Drop Wizard really shines is it is it really bakes into its core these concepts of health checks and metrics. Um, uh, and uh, and and it truly driven like that philosophy has has driven a lot of my personal philosophy as well as how to develop microservices. 
All right, Jesse, thank you, Michael, thank you. All right, um, another question. How do you figure out what metrics are your KPIs? I think a lot of that comes with testing, really. I think that from a developer point of view, and Jesse said this before, is you push out a lot of data, you push out a lot of metrics, and then you kind of whittle that down into things that matter. If you have a dashboard that you have to be responsible for, that people are looking at, you now have a responsibility, A, to the team, uh, but B, just for that knowledge. And each of those metrics and each of those graphs is going to say something to somebody. So explaining why that is an important piece will happen, I think, as part of that development cycle of seeing which things maybe cause outages or cause slowdowns or which things that you now start monitoring for because they've caused issues in the past. In Jesse's slide before, the instrumentation for code rollouts, it was, here's something that we were tracking at some point that might go away. So I think that we ended up with the same thing, which we put something in, we watched to make sure that it was performing well, when we were past that problem for some amount of time, then that gets cleaned up. Leaving old metrics around isn't helpful to anybody, because it just provides misleading information. So trying to find a way to balance that, I think, is really important. Yeah, there, there's no easy answer to that question. Um, really, it's it's just a it's a result of of developing and maintaining and operating the pro, uh, the, the the application. Um, you know, you get input from your product managers and your marketing team, from other developers and other operations people, um, and and they sort of you know, and then you combine that with your, you know, I'm speaking from the point of a view of a developer because that's really what I know. Uh, combine that with your, you know, internal knowledge, um, and and you, you know, you make some guesses, <laughs> you make some, you make some theories, uh, you test those against reality, and, and you refine as necessary. So, um, it sounds probably more scientific than it is, but but it's just it's work. You have to you have to do the work. All right, guys. Um, another couple questions. Let me see. How do you manage your on-call schedule with devs and ops on call? Jesse, can uh, take that one. Sure, uh, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so right now we're using um, we're using Ops Genie to sort of manage our on-call schedules, um, and uh, it's 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 a it's a pretty good program program, but it, but there are other ones like PagerDuty and other ones that sort of help you automate setup of schedules and shift rotations um, and and you know be able to give people heads up be able to give people um, apps that they can use to to uh, to uh, acknowledge or view alerts um, and also also it gives people a way to sort of trade shifts override shifts take shifts um, you you really want something that that gives you a good level of flexibility there. Um, we do a lot of things where our, our our standard schedule is right now is one day on one day one day on and then n days off where n is the number of other people on the team, um, and then we have an escalation level above that. So where a more senior person might like Mike might be um, on a longer shift, but they'll only be escalated to if the first first person on call isn't able to resolve it. So so for me that means I'm on call, you know, maybe once a week or so. Um, and, uh, and, and usually it's not that big a deal. We try to keep the shifts short so that you don't get burned out. And it's also easy to to trade those out. You know, we do this sort of thing where somebody will be going to the doctor one day or, or going on vacation and they need to trade this day for that day and, and we can all kind of yeah, it's just one day, no big deal. I'll trade for you, no problem. Mike, anything think, else? Yeah, I think you touched on it a little before that, which is A, everybody's on call, and B, we have meetings every week about what happened on call. Uh, so on call becomes less scary if things are being done to minimize what's actually happening in that on call scenario. As your documentation gets better, more people know how to fix things. As more okay. people get alerted, things get fixed. Being on call really should mean you don't get woke up. That's always the goal, is you know what can be fixed during business time and what can't be. And I think that's a, a big differentiator that people sometimes forget. Yeah. To use the same schedule for things that are important, for the things that aren't important, 
then when your disc hits 80%, somebody gets woke up at 2 in the morning. And maybe that's you just fills up fast and that's something you have to respond to. But in a lot of circumstances, if you went from 79 to 80 and you're not going to get past 80 till you know sometime in the morning, then maybe that's not going to be something you have to, to wake somebody up for. So I think mixing the that responsibility of everybody on call and just being aware of what's important uh, has made the on-call a lot easier for us. Yeah, and there's a lot more that we kind of want to do with it um, that we're trying to add in as as we as we go. Um, you know, I, I know other companies like um, Etsy and some other people are really sort of pushing the boundaries of of the on-call culture and how to make it easier. Um, they're doing things like sleep tracking um, and and really collecting data and applying applying that data to how how their their um, operators are are performing and how many on calls how many calls were they getting uh, you know if if uh, Sue got woken up four times the other night maybe don't put her on call next week you know maybe give her the day off maybe don't make her do something else um, so those are there's some really interesting stuff there um, that I encourage you to look into uh, to, to make things better. And uh, and one other thing that we you know we talked earlier about hey you know let's take the pager out of the hands of the ops people and put it into the devs and they, and make it a shared responsibility where I actually just started recently making our manager carry the pager as well so when the manager feels the pain like you know like the things get to get fixed <laughs> so um, if there is pain there we want to make sure that everybody is sort of experiencing that pain equally and then everybody has an incentive to make that pain not so bad. So put your managers on call. That's great. Make them work as well. Um, yeah. All right, got another question guys. How do you shard partition data in your Kafka queue? Um, yeah, I can talk about this. This is Jesse. Um, we, we came um, it wasn't really mentioned here, but um, you know, some of, some of us worked on a on a similar real time application in the past that's that's no longer around. And there we um, the decision was made at some point that we would we would shard Kafka by creating a separate topic for every customer. Um, and that was okay ish. Like it got us it got the it got us a fair amount of the way down the road, but. It ended up causing tons of problems. We had all of these leftover topics that people weren't sure if you could delete, um, and you really couldn't at that point in time actually delete topics from Kafka. And then Netflix was a customer, and like things just went crazy because some topics were just pushing tons and tons of data, other topics were pushing barely any. So when we when we went to rearchitect the the Pulse backend, um, we had some of that in mind. And and we and we first initially were like, well, let's have one topic. The way the that Kafka sort of has, scales is it has a topic for a data type, and then it scales that out by the number of partitions. Um, and each partition can have its own consumer, so it's sort of sub queues, but all with the same type of data, presumably. Um, so we thought, well, we'll have one topic, right? And then we'll and then we'll shard based on the organization ID or the account ID. And we did that for like a week and then we were like, wait a second, what the heck are we doing? Like this is gonna really cause the same exact problem that we had before when we get a big customer. Um, we are going to overload a single partition. So, so we went back to the drawing board a little bit and decided that what we needed to do was partition at the most granular level possible but such that um, there was some consistency about where the data was going. So for us, that ended up being the organization ID, the the name of the metric that we were looking at, like CPU or whatever, um, and the source of that metric, like the host name. And so those three things, we decided to represent what we kind of term as a stream, and we use that as the partition key. Um, this has a lot of interesting follow-on effects, but but the main thing for us is that really no matter how many customers we get, um, since they're all sending data at one second, we can scale out uniformly. Now that doesn't mean when we get a big customer coming online that we don't have to do something, but 
it does mean that we can do something and that every one of our consumers is already set up to consume this type of data. They have that expectation in mind um, and, and the producers are set to produce to multiple topics. Um, it's the same sort of it's the same sort of chicken counting idea but just applied to uh, Kafka partitions. Um, and, and that's been that's been really useful for us. Uh, any comments on that, Mike? No, that's a great overview. Uh, that was kind of how we got to where we where we got, which is if you make poor if you make decisions early on about how to shard, it can affect you later on as you scale up. So knowing what we know now, I think that's a lesson that other people could learn as well. Yeah, if. I just said one more thing. Like if we, if we had you know, gone ahead and implemented the organizational ID sharding, and then later on and gone live with that, it would have been much more difficult to rewrite stuff later on because we would have built all of our consumers with that sort of um, context in mind about oh well if I'm consuming from this partition then I know I'm getting all the data for this organization. Well that's that's not the case now. Um, and it never has been the case, but if we had to switch from one model to the other, it would have been very expensive. So, no pressure, get it right. <laughs> All right, guys, well, it looks like we are approaching the top of the hour and have to wrap this up shortly, and we do apologize if anybody's questions were not answered. Please note that all the questions that were not fielded here will be forwarded to Michael, Jesse, and their team to address. Uh, guys, are there any final thoughts, and how can people reach you? Uh, this is Michael. You can find me on Twitter at Code Moran, uh, and we look. I look forward to hearing from you. Yep, I'm on Twitter as well at G Jesse. Um, also have a GitHub account, and uh, you know I'm at BMC. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you. Great, Michael and Jesse. It was great having you both here today. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, once again, today's webinar was brought to you by BMC. I'm Jared Richter from DevOps.com. Uh, just a reminder, this presentation and slides will be available on DevOps.com within 24 hours. Again, thanks for joining us today. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All righty.